you know, if, if there's no end in sight to these sanctions, and many in the Russian elite believed indeed that these sanctions would be imposed on Russia one way or another if they invaded or if they didn't, then then I think we're, we're, we're seriously in trouble because, you know, Putin at that point has no reason to de-escalate. He only thinks, look, if the sanctions are going to be here no matter what, I only have a reason to escalate. It makes it, you know, even more necessary that I achieve my military and political aims in Ukraine because that's all I'm going to get. I'm not going to get any economic relief. I'm Chris Dixon, the director of the Global Policy Institute. Today, we'll be discussing the regional and international implications of the dreadful, deeply disturbing and still worsening situation in the Ukraine. Zach, it's really good to see you. And thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us about this worsening situation in the Ukraine. I wonder if I could just start the ball rolling by asking what you think about the timing of the decision to invade. Many of us were very, very surprised that the invasion took place, perhaps at all, but certainly when it did, though, of course, the USA, in the guise of the president, kept on telegraphing that the invasion was imminent and that it had been long planned. But as the invasion is unfolded, it seemed to me to be remarkably shambolic and didn't really give a, a picture of a, a well-planned, thoroughly thought through operation. With, it looked as if the tactics have changed. It looks as if the strategy might have changed. And also behind it, my impression is that the Russian population hadn't been prepared for an invasion of this scale or a war of this sort of magnitude, certainly compared to what happened before the annexation of the Crimea. So, you know, what, what, what do you think sparked this? Well, in, in terms of the preparation for the war, I mean, it's entirely possible that this war was being planned for more than a year, because as, we, as you may recall, the initial military buildup of Russian forces near the Ukrainian border began in the spring of 2021. There was an initial war scare, which later died down uh, when you saw the meeting at the presidential level between Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin in June uh, of last year in Geneva. Uh, and then there was a subsequent buildup in the fall, but most of the forces that were in the region, in fact, never left. So it's quite possible that this was being planned for a long time. It's just that it was probably being kept uh, you know, uh, in, in, at the level of the top brass, and that most of the military was not indeed prepared for this, uh, that many people thought that they were genuinely there for our training purposes and did not expect to be sent into battle. So that may explain to a certain extent why there, uh, you know, there, there was this shambolic element to it. You had soldiers who didn't, you know, quite know what they were there for. Uh, beyond that, I mean, I think that the larger reason why why you're seeing this sort of shambolic, as, as you called it, uh, you know, uh, course to these first few days of the operation is simply due to, you know, a political miscalculation on the Russian side, right? There was the expectation that the Ukrainians simply would not fight, that they would lay down their arms. Perhaps this was informed, uh, you know, by the situation in Afghanistan last summer, uh, in which you saw a U.S.-backed government with contested local legitimacy collapse in basically the span of a week, and Putin may have started to believe a little bit too much of his own propaganda. He may have believed as well that the Ukrainian government, uh, you know, is largely dysfunctional, that it's basically an illegitimate U.S.-backed proxy government that, you know, took over by way of a, a coup in 2014 uh, and did not enjoy deep popular support because, you know, as Putin likes to say, you know, in reality, Ukraine belongs to Russia, or at least the Ukrainian people and, and the Russian people are, are you know, a single people, and, and that's their genuine preference. So for all those reasons, he probably thought that it would have been very easy to make a quick run towards Kiev to decapitate the leadership without much fighting and without you know many casualties, mm -hmm. uh, because such casualties, of course, would be very unpopular back at home, uh, given the deep people-to-people uh, -people ties uh, between Russia and Ukraine, among other factors as well. What actually actually sparked it? I mean, do you, did do you think that something happened uh, um, that? He, Putin thought there was some additional threat that he was facing that needed to be dealt with quickly, or had he simply just run out of, of patience and had decided that there was no way forward uh, with the negotiations? Therefore, 
Now, my, my guess is is the latter. I mean, obviously, I'm not inside Vladimir Putin's well, mind. No. I don't. I, I don't think that anyone is, and I don't think that that you know it'll certainly be up to future historians to be able to uh, devise whether or not this war was planned all along and Russia basically submitted. Uh, its demands for security guarantees late last year to, to the U.S. and NATO with the expectation that they would be rejected, which would then serve as a pretext to launch a war. Or perhaps they were actually genuinely interested in finding a diplomatic solution in those early weeks and months of that of that process that began late last year. But that, as you say, you know, they, they basically ran out of patience and decided that, you know, the West was not prepared to engage with Russia's, you know, core stated demands and therefore that a military solution was was the only option. Uh, we don't know. Maybe future historians will be able to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is how it's played out. We are where we are right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, Zach, um, uh, it'd, be, it's, it's, it'd be interesting to find out, uh, you know, in respect of how, how long do you think this will go on for? Um, I mean, at this, at this point in time, there are, uh, th- there's another round of talks between Russia and Ukraine, they are ongoing uh, as, as we speak, in fact. Um, but prior to this, um, President Putin had discussions with President Macron, um, where President Putin basically said that uh, what he's looking for uh, to, to settle this uh, from Ukraine's perspective is, is that of agreeing that Ukraine takes on neutrality and that it becomes essentially a demilitarized country. Those are the two conditions that uh, President Putin said uh, the Russians require from Ukraine. And if 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 the um, if the Ukrainian side drags on with with this, that the Russians may well come up with new conditions. Uh, in fact, so so what are you, what are your thoughts on 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 these uh, current negotiations and how long this could pos- potentially drag on for? Well, my guess is that unless Vladimir Zelensky has some sort of epiphany in which he decides that he wants to save his people a tremendous amount of bloodshed, I think that this could go on for quite some time. Uh, some people were thinking that there would be you know, a palace coup in Moscow, while the chances of, of that occurring are perhaps higher now than they ever have been in the history of, of Putin's presidency, I wouldn't rank them as incredibly high. Um, and, you know, from what we've seen so far in, pre- in terms of preliminary data, uh, it looks as if support for, for Putin has gone up since the beginning of the war rather than down. Certainly the sanctions are proving devastating to the Russian economy, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, you know, the Russian people are, are basically going to, you know, overthrow, uh, you know, their regime overnight. So, you know, I think we need to lower our expectations a little bit there. It, it appears as if, you know, the Western policy de facto is to, you know, basically attempt some sort of regime change in Russia as a means of solving this this crisis, um, especially because you know Western the Western side has already demonstrated that it's not willing to compromise on on Ukraine's red lines concerning Ukraine's desire to join NATO, and that that certainly will not be the case uh, now that a war has broken out and that there is the perceived need to punish Russia for for its actions. So my guess is that it's entirely possible that this will continue for several more days, if not weeks. Uh, which would raise the level of of, of casualties and, and brutality uh, from the Russian side towards the Ukrainian side substantially. Uh, it's something to be very worried about because, of course, it could lead to uh, inadvertent escalation. Perhaps if it does escalate to the level of, of a NATO-Russia direct conflict, perhaps then you know NATO will be able to put its foot down and say, okay, you know, we need to get this under control. We need to bring this to an end. But I certainly hope that it doesn't get that far. Um, but unfortunately, for, for now, you know, Ukraine is buoyed by its early successes in, in this conflict and therefore, uh, you know, will likely want to continue fighting, um, which, you know, means that, that there will be much more bloodshed. That doesn't mean that Russia will ultimately succeed in, its, in achieving its political aims in Ukraine. We know what those political aims are and you just spilled them out. Uh, but it's entirely possible that those aims will require, you know, a maximalist, uh, you know, military strategy, which might even go beyond simply decapitating the leadership and might have to involve occupying major Ukrainian cities, which is something, of course, that the Russians initially in this campaign wanted to avoid doing, um, and which could come with urban warfare, guerrilla warfare, etc. Uh, so, you know, this, this, this is a very bad situation we're in right now, and it's just not easy to see a way out. It's also very hard to see the Russians at this point turning down the temperature because they don't really have an off-ramp. 
Um, you know, if the West had communicated very clearly, as, for example, Sam Cherup pointed out in, in a recent piece earlier this week in the Financial Times, you know, had the West communicated that some of the sanctions, let's say the sanctions on Russia's central bank, you know, would be lifted if Russia agreed to an immediate ceasefire and to come to the table and negotiate, uh, you know, a, a lasting peace in good faith, uh, then perhaps there would be an incentive for Russia to de-escalate and to come to the table. But from the looks of things, uh, you know, in, in the West, Russia appears just so politically unpalatable right now that any such signaling from the West just does not seem politically feasible. Uh, and so, you know, if, if there's no end in sight to these sanctions, and many in the Russian elite believed indeed that these sanctions would be imposed on Russia one way or another if they invaded or if they didn't, because they have this deeply held belief that, that you know, the West is out to get Russia, that this is a struggle for Russia's survival, that the West basically, you know, wants Russia to be weak, um, then, then I think we're, we're, we're seriously in trouble because, you know, Putin at that point has no reason to de-escalate. He only thinks, look, if the sanctions are going to be here no matter what, I only have a reason to escalate. It makes it, you know, even more necessary that I achieve my military and political aims in Ukraine because that's all I'm going to get. I'm not going to get any economic relief. Certainly, there were suggestions from the American end that the sanctions were, in many circles, they're regarded as permanent, which, as you say, is 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 not a particularly fertile position for any negotiated settlement. Indeed. I mean, uh, sanctions are much easier to impose than they are to lift. And, and we've learned that over the course of the past several years. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't seemed to have internalized that lesson, what it actually implies for, for finding some sort of way to stabilize mm -hmm. Russia-West relations, right? I mean, you saw Joe Biden, you know, after his first few months in office, in which there was sort of some initial condemnation of, of the arrest of, 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 of um, uh, Alexei Navalny in, in, in Russia, you know, despite the, and, and you saw Putin, uh, Putin called a killer as well by Biden sort of in those early months. After those early months of the Biden administration passed, you saw a pivot by the Biden administration towards wanting to emphasize, you know, a stable and predictable relationship with Russia as a means of creating the space for the U.S. to focus instead on China. And now that's mm -hmm. all well and good. And that was a very consistent, you know, message that was coming out of, of the White House and the State Department. The only issue is that, you know, it, it appears as if Washington and, and other Western allies have not been prepared actually to take the measures necessary to bring about a stable and predictable relationship, right? But basically, what, what the Kremlin was doing in, and, and what the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was doing in, in releasing those draft treaties late last year between the US and Russia and NATO and Russia on Russia's so-called security guarantees was to say to the West, look, you want a stable and predictable relationship with us? Well, here's the cost, here's the price. Uh, and it was a price clearly that we were unprepared to pay, and that's for a whole number of different reasons. But one of them, obviously, is that in the post-Cold War era, we've ranked certain principles higher than geopolitical stability when it comes to, to Europe, or at least we believe, you know, rightly or wrongly, it seems wrongly, uh, that those principles are actually guarantors of stability and security in Europe. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, having a European security order based exclusively on the right of states or the supposed right of states to choose their geopolitical orientation, that is not a guarantee of, of security and stability. By definition, that is, a, that is an order that, that dismisses Russia's stated security concerns as either illegitimate or, you know, of secondary concern. Uh, and the fact is that Russia is the most powerful country in Europe in military terms. So there is no way that you're ever going to have a stable European security order based on, on such principles. What about the question of the, the Ukraine joining the EU? I mean, we've had some very sort of mixed messages on, on both sides, but there seems to have been some positive noises from, from the, the EU. Is, yeah. is this a starter or is this just going to escalate, escalate the situation? Well, I mean, so I'm sure that that, you know, Putin would not want Ukraine to join the EU in, in principle, but it's certainly not as much of a red line for Russia as Ukraine joining NATO. Right. Uh, so, you know, in the meantime, Ukraine certainly does not yet meet the acquis to be able to join the European Union. We're talking about something that perhaps might happen over the longer term. You know, what might occur or what might not occur, we don't know, but what might occur as a symbolic move you know, is the recognition of Ukraine as officially as a candidate country to join the European right. Union. Who knows how long, you know, that will last. You know, Turkey's been a candidate country for a long time, but it looks as if, you know, Ursula von der Leyen the other day was was quite sincere in, in, no, quite. in you know, yeah, in, in her desire. She, to, she, she seemed to be very positive on that. Um, so you, you think that that could be, that could be 
some sort of compromise that the Russians might be prepared to say, not NATO, but a candidature to the EU. Well, there, 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 there are two positive things I think that might come from that. I mean, no, number one is that uh, there has been in, in uh, from Moscow's perspective for quite some time, the idea that NATO and the EU are basically two sides of the same coin, right? That the EU mm -hmm. is basically little more than, than the economic arm of NATO, and it's an integral part of the transatlantic alliance. And you're seeing deeper cooperation between NATO and the EU in, in recent years as well. Uh, so for, for all those reasons, uh, you know, the, uh, basically, there's this this this, this view in, in Moscow that does not really see Europe as having a tremendous amount of agency, and that you know, that all of Europe is basically controlled directly from Washington. Um, I think it would be useful uh, to distinguish between NATO and the EU, and one way of doing that, of course, is by promising Ukraine a path towards EU membership and not NATO membership, which could reinforce the notion. Uh, that, um, that, you know, that the EU is a peace project and not, you know, the economic arm of a military alliance. So that could be quite useful. Another positive that could come out of it is that, you know, one of the weaknesses of, of the European Union's Eastern Partnership has been that it has proposed that uh, countries in, in the post-Soviet space or in, in the European neighborhood uh, undertake some, some very difficult and often painful reforms, political reforms and economic reforms, but without the promise that at the end of the day, they'll be able to obtain EU membership as a reward for, for their efforts. Uh, and it might be useful uh, for the European Union to be able to say to Ukraine, perhaps to others as well, that uh, much like the Western Balkan countries, there is, in fact, an eventual path to, to membership for you. And that could be much more consistent. Maybe it's not a path to full membership. Maybe it's possible, and we've done some research on this at, at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, maybe it's possible to envisage forms of differentiated integration, you know, or multiple different levels of accession in which you benefit from some of the privileges of membership at each stage of accession. That, that doesn't exist right now. Uh, but that would be a, an interesting uh, proposal to explore. Um, of course, these would have been perhaps more useful proposals to explore before war broke out. Now that war has broken out, things are obviously a little bit uh, trickier. All right, thank you. I think, I think, I think that's a very, very interesting insight. Um, I just wonder, finally, if you could throw a little bit of light on exactly what the EU's sort of end game might be in this at the moment. I mean, what, what are they, what would they like to see? What are they, what are they tr trying to, to get done? Well, I mean, I'm sure that the European Union would prefer to see a cessation of hostilities uh, in, in Ukraine and, uh, you know, return to the principles that, that it claims to uh, uphold, which is that Ukraine has the right to seek as close of a relationship with the European Union as it so desires because uh, the EU is an independent, excuse me, uh, Ukraine is an independent country and that no third party has, has anything to do with that. In the meantime, the EU, you know, appears to be using uh, this periodic episode, which may or may not be sustained uh, of anti-Russian unity among its members to be able to, you know, move the yardsticks a little bit forward on issues related to, to getting more serious about, uh, uh, about uh, continental defense. And that might be something that'll be very useful because you know, obviously, uh, the U.S. will have to reinforce its presence in Europe as a result of this conflict, uh, even though it does want to pivot towards the, the Pacific region to confront China, which is a much you know, longer term and generational struggle that, that you know, both political parties in Washington have, have identified as such. Uh, so, you know, Washington may have to reinforce the barracks in Europe right now. But, you know, over the longer term, I think they really do want to see that that this crisis has you know spurred Europe into getting more serious about its own defense. And if you don't see that happen, you're, you're seeing it you know perhaps happen as an immediate reaction. But if the momentum for that is not sustained uh, you know over the years ahead, you know that could cause a, a pretty serious irritant in the transatlantic alliance. Uh, you know, seeing that an event you know if 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 an event as 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 great in magnitude as this does not spur them to to do that. And that could play out very, very badly and very irresponsibly in the event that Donald Trump or someone like Donald Trump becomes president again in, in 2025. I, I should just add, Zach, with respect to, to, to the EU, that um, today um, Georgia, Georgia has formally submitted its application for EU membership. Um, that, that may be interesting to see what happens there, perhaps as a, as a precursor in terms of what can happen with Ukraine. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, indeed, I, I saw that as well. So uh, it'll certainly be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, obviously, Ukraine and, and Georgia, despite you know many similarities in terms of both of their desire to, to accede to NATO, 
have adopted different uh, approaches towards the relations with Russia over recent years. Uh, you know, since the Saakashvili years, my understanding is that Georgia has moved towards embracing a slightly more pragmatic relationship with Moscow, uh, you know, whereas Ukraine, of course, has, has been sort of a, a clear, uh, you know, a, a possible front line for, for conflict between, between Russia and the West, um, a flashpoint, I should say. Uh, you know, given that, you know, especially in the past year since Joe Biden became president, also before that, you know, during Petro Poroshenko's presidency in which Ukraine really embraced a, a strong ethno-nationalist and, and pro-Western agenda. Um, Zelensky also, you know, when Joe Biden was elected, pivoted from his initial pro-peace, uh, you know, uh, electoral platform uh, towards, you know, a much more open embrace of, of uh, an, an active and, and, and visible embrace of, of wanting to, to, to move decisively in the direction of, of joining NATO. Uh, also, you know, closing a, a number of pro-Russian TV stations, et cetera. Uh, so basically, since Joe Biden has become president, uh, you know, th this apparently, you know, might have been an opportunity for Zelensky to to seize, at least from his perspective, uh, you know, the, the chance to uh, to recover uh, or turn around his his sagging polling numbers and, you know, find some sort of way to, to, to improve his own political fortunes. Uh, that was certainly one of the factors that brought us to, to the brink, uh, you know, not to excuse Russia's actions. Russia is 100 percent responsible for launching this war. It was a war of choice. They did not have to deal with this crisis through military means. It is an illegal act of aggression, and we should not mince words about that. But there are certainly several different factors, several different decisions that were taken by the Russians, by the Ukrainians and by Western governments over the past several months, over the past year, uh, over the past number of years since 2014, and of course, over the past 30 years since the end of the Cold War that helped to explain where we are today. Zach, I think that was extremely good and a very excellent summary at the end. And at that point, we are out of time, um, but I hope everybody will join us for the second stage of this, where we look at the wider regional and international uh, issues.